That's like the year. Just it's, it's the year of delivery, Christmas. And I want to talk to you about Christmas delivery. Uh, this message is called Christmas Carriers, and you can follow along in the notes in our app as well. But I was thinking about the job security that you have right now. If you are a UPS driver, a FedEx driver, a DHL driver, a United States Postal Service, Amazon, uh, whatever other ones there are out there, it's job security, isn't it, this time of year? I mean, right now in this season, they are busier than ever. So be nice to them when they come to your door because they are working long hours. But this is like an important job this year. Like we are counting more than ever on those people, those delivery carriers. We're counting on them to deliver Christmas (laughs) more than we ever have. And so I want to talk to you about the Christmas delivery, but a little bit of a different Christmas delivery. This one came via the Pony Express. That's my one dad joke, and there will be no more, I promise. All right, let's turn to Luke 126 through 38. Luke chapter 1, we're going to read this story in, about what we just saw up there, but it'll be a, a little bit more accurate <laughs> because we're reading from the actual Bible. All right, Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the most power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Will you pray with me as we get into this message, Lord? We come before you. I pray that you breathe your life into this word today in this place. That you would help us to hear what we need to hear in this. That you would, uh, that your word would shape us and change us and transform our lives. We give you this word and the remainder of this service, Lord. And just be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we have this woman, Mary. Really a girl, young, young woman. She was from a town called Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was one of those towns that if you weren't from the area, you hadn't heard of it. It was a nowhere town. Nobody had ever heard of that town. In fact, there's a historian, his name is Josephus from the time, and he had over 2,000 writings, and in none of the writings was Nazareth ever mentioned. It wasn't ever mentioned because it wasn't an important place. It wasn't an important town. It's like, I don't know if this happens to you, but it happens to me when people say, where are you from? And I say, Ording, and they go, Oregon? <laughs> Always. Every pastor's conference I ever go to. Where are you from? Ording. Oregon? No, Orteen. And they stare at the name tag. Where's that? Well, you know, have you heard of Sumner? And they look at you funny like, Puyallup, maybe Tacoma. Yeah, okay, yeah, it's kind of by that, you know, and you just kind of go with it because they haven't heard of it. And that's kind of what Nazareth was like. The people that weren't from that region, they just, they wouldn't have heard of Nazareth before. But I tell you what, they're talking about Nazareth now, aren't they? They're talking about Nazareth now, and I believe that they're going to be talking about Ording as well because God's going to put this place on the map. I see God already stirring in this place as I've been meeting with the, the new pastor here at Sound Life Church, just have this sense is that God's just stirring in this city, and, and we're both just excited about what he's doing. So uh, that's just a reminder. Pray, will you pray for this church? Just pray for Sound Life Church. Will you pray for their Christmas Eve services and uh, that God would bless them? And I, I just believe that God is, is moving in this place. So we have this place, Nazareth, this nowhere town where God chooses to begin where God chooses to send Jesus. This is where he delivers. This is the delivery address for his son is a town that no one has heard of. And also to a young lady who wouldn't have been heard of 
as well. Mary was still young. She was pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Now, in the translation I read, it says she was betrothed. Now, betrothal is, a, is basically what you would consider our engagement. They could actually get engaged like as toddlers, really. Arranged marriage, you just, there you go. You're, you're getting married, you're committed, you're pledged, you're engaged. But betrothal was the actual time preceding the wedding, the actual marriage, where you were preparing for marriage. You were preparing yourself for marriage. So they weren't married yet, but they were, in our terms, they were engaged to be married. Now, at this point in Mary's life, she wasn't a woman of influence. She wasn't a woman um, who had anything. She was young. She, had, she wasn't married. She had no kids. She had no possessions. She happened to not get nominated homecoming queen on her senior year, and nothing really was significant about her. She was just a girl, just a girl from a, who no one would know, from a town that no one has heard of. And this is how God works. He chooses an insignificant girl from an insignificant place where he does his best work. Did you know that that's true still to this day? God will choose the most insignificant things in our eyes to do his most significant work. And so don't be counting yourself out. Don't be counting yourself out that God could use you or, I don't know that God could do this. Don't count yourself out. You look at what God did. He sent his very son to an insignificant place in the world's eyes, but in his eyes, it was not insignificant at all. And Mary was the chosen carrier. She was the chosen carrier. When you're getting ready to mail something this Christmas, you've got to go and choose a carrier first. And you want to choose a carrier that you trust. You want to choose a carrier that has never lost a package before. Well, one of your packages. And, and you want to choose someone reliable. And so you've got to choose the carrier when you're going to send your Christmas gifts out. And God chose a carrier too, and that was Mary. Mary was the carrier to bring Jesus to the world. Mary was who God had chosen to bring his son to this world. Now, he could have chosen someone famous. He could have chosen someone so that Jesus would have been well-known. He could have chosen someone who was wealthy so that his son would be provided for. Isn't that what you would do if you were God? I'm going to make sure that, you know, I think the palace looks like a good place for my son to come into the world because then he'll have all the best of this and the best of this and the best of this. He could have chosen someone with mothering experience, but he chose someone with no experience at all. He chose someone who wasn't famous, who wasn't wealthy, in fact, who was very poor, who had no experience, and he commissioned her to be the carrier that would deliver Jesus. And we read here in our text that Mary was commissioned for this role by grace. It was by grace. Now, in the translation that I read, it says favor. That Mary had found favor with the Lord. The angel said to her, Mary, you have found favor with God. This word favor is the Greek word charis, and it means grace. And so in some translations, you'll see it translated as grace instead of favor, but there's somewhat interchangeably because really what charis means in the Greek is that which causes favorable regard. So there's an honor and there is a favor that comes with a grace. This word is found 150 times in the New Testament. I think that God wanted us to understand what grace was really about. It's all over the New Testament. The New Testament is the new covenant. It is the covenant through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and it is birthed in grace. It's not something you earn. Mary didn't earn it. It's not based on your skill set or qualification. It's poured out freely on an undeserving recipient. So whether you feel as though you're worthy and deserving of God's grace or undeserving of God's grace, he pours out his grace all the same. All the same. And Mary's primary role in carrying Jesus to the world was simply one thing, obedience. That was her role. She says, okay, as you said, it will be done. Her role was obedience. Sometimes I think we, we get to these places where we think, man, I just, I want to do something great for God, and, but I just can't come up with any good ideas. I'm not sure how I would pull it off. And yet, Mary... She did something huge for God, and all she had to do was obey. She just had to wait for God to make the plan and say, okay, I will obey. She didn't have anything to do with choosing the pregnancy. It was just God. 
The part that she played was her response to God. And still to this day as Christians, I think that is something we've got to keep in mind in our lives that we can respond to God in a way, in obedience, and he does the rest. He does the rest, and so we have this angel of the Lord comes to Mary. He comes to Mary, and he says, God has chosen you, and she says, I'll do it. I don't know if not doing it was an option, but she said she would do it. And I wonder what that message was like back to God from Gabriel. God's already omniscient, so he knew. But anyway, I'm sure Gabriel got to go back to God and say, she's in. It's like that. It's like that little ding you get on your phone when your Amazon package is delivered, and it's like so exciting. Can you imagine what it was like for God to just ding? She's going to be the one. She's going to be the one. She said, yes, God. Mary was filled with the Holy Spirit, not just chosen. So she's chosen by grace. And then after she's chosen by grace, he says, you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Mary asks this question in verse 34. She says to the angel, how are you going to pull this off? How are you going to do that? Because I haven't done what's necessary to get pregnant. This is a reasonable question to ask. Very reasonable. When God speaks to you and he says, I want you to do this impossible thing, it's okay to say, can you you help me figure out how you're going to pull that off because I don't have what it takes to make that happen. And Mary, quite respectfully, even though it says she was a bit terrified, says, can you help me understand how this is all going to work? And the response is this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the second response was, nothing is impossible with God. See, in her mind, in that moment, can you just imagine what was going through her mind? This is not possible. Like, I know that's an angel, I'm pretty sure, but this isn't possible. Like, it just doesn't make sense. I don't know how that's supposed to happen, and I've never heard of someone who's been pregnant, who hasn't done what is necessary to get pregnant. I know there's younger people in the room, so I'm trying to be vague here. You can figure it out. (laughs) But he says, here's the thing. Nothing's impossible to God. You know, those two responses from the angels, something tells me they're very connected. Because when the Holy Spirit of God gets involved, impossible things start taking place. Have you experienced this in your life? When the Holy Spirit of God... Last week, I was talking about the Holy Spirit and... I actually, I haven't listened to the message from last week, so I'm not actually sure what I said. I should probably go do that. <laughs> but if you weren't here, I guess you had to be here. Um, I, I brought these books called The God I Never Knew, and it is called How Real Friendship with the Holy Spirit Can Change Your Life. And anyone that wants these can have them or borrow them and give them back, pass them on, and I'm just going to leave them up here somewhere. And I only have two with me, but I'll have another, like, eight or so, Christmas Eve, and I'll, I'll bring them, uh, that'll change your life. I was talking to Pastor Carolyn this week, and she's like, please tell anyone that wants to, to learn more about the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit, please have them come meet with me, um, because there is just <laughs> impossible things start happening in your life when the Holy Spirit is involved. Miracles break out. Lives get transformed. And in this case, Jesus gets delivered to the world. Through the work of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, her womb was filled, and she would carry Jesus with her for nine months. Nine months. Nine months of waiting. Can you imagine that waiting? Like some of you, in fact, many of you have been pregnant, and I know nine months is a long time to wait. But imagine waiting nine months when you know that you're carrying the Son of God. It can't come fast enough. Like, this is something that God is going to do. He's literally going to birth something through her. And she's waiting and anticipating and dreaming, what will God do with this delivery? And then finally the day came. She had been chosen by grace. She had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And now Mary delivered Jesus to the world. It says in Luke 2, 7 that when she gave birth to her firstborn son, she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger. I wonder what that night was like for Mary. Like, we've seen the movies, and we, we've kind of imagined it in our mind, but I wonder what it was really like in her heart to hold in her arms the promise of God to her. 
the personal promise of God to her that she was able to hold the one in her arms, the one who would redeem mankind. That is an incredible thing to think about. That, that she would look upon his face knowing that through her, God had delivered this baby boy as a gift to all the world. That he wasn't just a gift to her, that he was a gift to the world. And she was the Christmas carrier. She was the one. She was the carrier of Jesus. She was, well, the first Christmas carrier. She was the one who brought Jesus to the world. It was through Mary, through the grace of God, through the Holy Spirit of God, Mary delivered Jesus to the world. But she wasn't the only carrier to bring Jesus to the world. She was the first, but she isn't the last because God still uses people to this day to carry Jesus to this world. And he will continue to use his people to carry Jesus to the world. And you know, we have the same calling that Mary, that Mary has. Now, figuratively, not literally, <laughs> we get to carry Jesus to the world. We are, we are the Christmas carriers. We are the ones that God has given authority. He has given a charge. He has given assignment. He has entrusted us to carry Jesus to the world. We have the same calling as Mary. And I don't know if you've ever read this story in this way before, but I hope that when you read this from now on and you read this incredible calling that God put on Mary's life, that you would identify and say, wow, I have the same calling to carry and deliver Jesus to this world. We are the Christmas carriers. In fact, we have the same three things in common with Mary. We have also been commissioned by grace, just like Mary. She was commissioned by grace. The favor of the Lord was upon her, and you have been commissioned by grace. The favor of the Lord is upon you. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 8 and 9, it says, for it is by grace. That word grace is that same word, charis. It's the same word that it was spoken to Mary, that favor of the Lord. It is by that grace that you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. The favor of the Lord comes by the grace of the Lord through the work of Jesus on the cross today. And because of Jesus... Because of what he's done. Now, now I, I hope in your life that you have received Jesus. But I also hope that there's someone here who hasn't who is ready to today. To receive Jesus into your life. Because when you have received him into your life, the Lord calls out to us, Greetings, O favored one. He calls out to us, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. The same thing that the angel of the Lord said to Mary, I believe the Lord would call out to his people, you are favored and I am with you. Thy grace is upon you and I am with you. Now you might feel unqualified. You might feel insignificant. You might feel undeserving. Mary probably did too. But here's the thing, by the grace of God, you've been commissioned as a carrier of Jesus. We just tell someone around you, you've been commissioned. It is by the grace of God. Now, when Mary asks the angel, how will this be? What was his response? The Holy Spirit. And we too are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Sometimes it seems impossible that God could do this or this or this. Sometimes it seems even more impossible that God could do this or this and this through me. These are the, the places where we just feel, does anyone ever feel that way besides me? Where God began to work and you're like, I don't know how you're going to use me for this. I'm sure, God, you had a lot of choices. Why me? It doesn't seem to make sense, God. And we get to these places where it seems like whatever God wants to do through us seems impossible because of our current circumstances. And we get stuck in those circumstances. We get stuck in those places where we're saying, God, don't you see that this is not the best time right now? God, don't you see that I don't have the resources? It seems impossible. God, it's impossible because my circumstances don't lend themselves to this. God, it seems impossible because my resources don't lend themselves to this. God, it's impossible. But here's what the angel of the Lord says to Mary. Nothing is impossible with God. You see, to God, your impossibility is simply an opportunity. 
We say, God, it's impossible. And he says, awesome, and an opportunity. An opportunity to show them how great I am. An opportunity to show them how much I love them. An opportunity to show them that I can work through them. Listen, God is not phased by what you don't have. He instead equips you with what he has. He's not phased by what you lack because he lacks nothing and he will equip you. It says in Acts 1.8, Jesus said this. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, you don't live near Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. But essentially what Jesus was saying, all over the place, everywhere, all the regions, all the places, you will be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit. Now, listen. Listen to this purpose here. Jesus says, you will receive power, and then he connects that, and you will be my witnesses. There's a connection piece. There's a connection piece that the Holy Spirit empowers us to go and be the carriers of Jesus. He empowers us to go be carriers of the gospel of Jesus. It's not by your doing. It's not by your strength. Zechariah 4, 6 says, It's not by might or nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, God Almighty. And it is by his spirit that Jesus will be delivered to the world. Just like Mary delivered Jesus, we have that same responsibility to be that carrier of Jesus to the world. We deliver Jesus to the world. You might look around in your life and you can think of someone right now in your mind, oh my goodness, she needs Jesus. Well, guess what? God didn't pick FedEx, he picked you. He picked you. <laughs> oh God, no, no. Come on, there's someone else, please, Lord. Now, I'm not saying that <laughs> it's on your shoulders that everybody in the world gets saved. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, you start praying for that person. You start praying for them and let God begin to lead you because there's a good chance he's going to lead you to be the carrier of Jesus to that person. It might just be through your actions. It might be through your words. It might be through your prayers. But you are called to carry Jesus to the world. He chose us to be those carriers. And our delivery vehicle, so to speak, we are the vehicle. And the Holy Spirit fuels us. And now it's time to go out and deliver. First Thessalonians 2 forces, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. I think that's a thing that we got to really keep in mind. We know, I, I bet if I asked most of you, can you tell me how we, we are saved by Jesus? Most of you could say, Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and he took the punishment for me, and I have been redeemed by grace. Most of us can say that. But let's not take for granted the gospel. We have been entrusted with the gospel. It is a precious thing that God says, look, I'm entrusting you with this. I'm entrusting you to carry this. I've given you this. Please don't lose my mail. I've entrusted you with this gospel. Because he's trusted us as the Christmas carriers that we should have an expectancy that he will actually use us to be the ones to deliver. What would happen if God's church went about their lives, or how about all of us left this room today with an expectancy of God, you're going to use me to tell someone about Jesus this week. Whew. Now, some of you, that might terrify, but let's back up. You have the grace of the Lord, and you have the Holy Spirit, and he'll take care of it. But what would happen if God's people begin to have an expectations in our life that we'd say, God, give me an opportunity to deliver you. Would you show me, Lord God, where is the next address that you want me to deliver Jesus to? What would happen in our community? What would happen in our world? I tell you what, the revival that many of you are praying for would start happening. That there would be a, a resuscitation of life to people who have lost hope, who are desperate, who are depressed, who are struggling. Right now in this season, more than ever in 2020, the, the, the rates of suicide and depression and anxiety are at a massive, massive high. 
not long into all the government lockdowns, I, I think I heard the number that the suicide hotline had a 300% increase in calls. Listen, there are people desperate for Jesus. They are desperate for Jesus. And they're ready to hear. I believe that we are in a place right now where it, it seems as though the world doesn't want to hear. But I'm telling you, people need and want to hear some hope coming from you in your life. They need hope in their life. Are we expecting God to move in our lives? Do we expect that he would move? Uh, we, I believe that we're supposed to have an expectation. God, I expect you to move. I expect, Lord God, you to use me. You know what another word for expecting is? Pregnant. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it, but you're pregnant with the gospel. God has entrusted you. Mary was pregnant with Jesus. You're pregnant with the gospel. And God wants to birth something through us. He wants to birth something through his church that will change the course of people's lives. That he'll bring transformation. He'll bring revival. Like Mary wants to birth something new through us and in us. And that happens only if we say, okay, God, I will be the carrier. I will be the carrier. God, I, I'll take it up. I will respond like Mary responded, maybe like, how, God? That doesn't make sense. But then when he says, I got that part figured out, and she says, okay, I'm your servant. I got this. What would our response be? Mary, she embraced the grace of God. Mary received the spirit of the Lord. Mary was ready to deliver Jesus to the world. How about us? That's my question for us Today, are we ready to deliver Jesus to the world? And I think, Mike, can you come up? Donna, can you come up? I think sometimes we need to get out of our own heads on this. Come on, you ever overthink sharing Jesus with someone? <laughs> oh, but I don't know. I don't have the whole Bible memorized. <laughs> Listen, God has chosen you as his carrier this Christmas. He's chosen you. He's going, I don't know, it's not online delivery, but it's something. <laughs> He's chosen a delivery uh, method of his people. To say, will you take Jesus to the world? Will you take the gospel to the world? Because there's a world that desperately needs to hear about the life that Jesus brings. Do you believe that Jesus brings life? Has anyone experienced life that Jesus brings? Yeah? Come on, you are rowdy in worship. <laughs> do, do you, have you, anyone experienced like actual life in Jesus? Man, there are so many people who need to experience that same life. They don't even know what they're missing. But God says, I've chosen you. You who are highly favored. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the Most High will empower you and you will deliver Jesus to your world. Will you stand with me today as we pray? I want to pray over you. I have a sense right now that there's someone here who feels God feel like right now that God's calling you to be a missionary. And if that's you, uh, would you come pray with Wayne? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I know, see, I can always call, I know he'll pray for anyone, anytime. No, really, if, if I believe, like, if God's tugging on someone's heart right now, you know what, I feel a call to be a missionary. My, my message wasn't about missions, it was just about being a missionary in your everyday life, but I believe that there's someone here who God's calling to missions abroad, beyond Ording, Puyallup, Sumner, Tacoma, beyond this region, and if that's you, we want to pray over you and encourage you for the rest of you who are called and this is your mission field would you just put your hands out in front of you like you're gonna, gonna receive alright you're the employee right now behind the counter at the UPS store and God's walking up and he says I got a package that I need you to deliver Lord we receive it right now we take on this package we take on this delivery of Jesus to our world we thank you that you have entrusted us with the gospel. You have placed it in our hands. Help us to steward that, Lord. 
Lord, would you show us what the address is that you're sending this to? That you would begin to highlight people in our lives, Lord God, that you want us to deliver Jesus to. It might be our neighbors, it might be our kids, it might be our parents. Lord, would you begin to show us, would you speak to your people, Lord God, and would you give us courage and strength to deliver you, Jesus, to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close with a chorus here. Missionary, come up here and pray with Wayne. (laughs) And uh, if you want prayer for anything at all, will you just come up front? Our, our prayer team would love to pray with you tonight. I hope to see you guys again soon, maybe on Christmas Eve. God bless you all. Pastor Eric will be up here shortly to close us out. Mike, Donna, go ahead. pastor on staff here for like nine years, the hardest thing to do is to close a service. It's the hardest thing to do. But going along with the the message that Pastor Brad shared, I want to just leave us with a challenge from Luke chapter 2. You know, after Jesus, you know, he he was born and he, he grew up when he was eight years old, he was taken to the temple. 
and he was presented at the temple, and there was a prophetess there named Anna. And many scholars would say she had been at the temple for approximately 60 years, maybe even more. And she had been waiting and praying and fasting for the Messiah to come. And this was the day that he showed up. This is what the Bible said in Luke chapter 2, verse 37. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. The challenge going forth is it is time to leave the temple. It is time to carry the message of Jesus to the highways and to the byways of our life. Okay, not only has 2020 been a stressful season, Christmas usually is a stressful season for whatever reason. But we carry hope and we carry a remedy and we carry a cure for all of that. So let's take the challenge that was given today and let's carry Jesus with us to people that are expecting him to show up because people need him. People need it. People need what we carry. So I'm going to pray. You guys be blessed. The altar's open if you need prayer for anything, healing, just agreement in prayer, whatever it is, come up and get prayer. And uh, have a great week. Reminder, again, register for the Christmas Eve service. There's two. And then we'll have a uh, service again here Saturday night. Come expecting God to do some amazing things. So, Lord, we just thank you for this time to be challenged, to be intimate with you. And, Lord, I just pray that we would all leave here and carry Jesus to a world that is expecting a miracle. They are expecting healing. They are expecting, Lord, to hope. So, God, I pray that we would be the carriers of that. Holy Spirit, empower us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you all. Bless you at home who are watching online.